You know, someone once said that character is who you are when nobody but God is watching. You know, character is built over time. It's not something that you wake up one day and say, you know, I want to be a, a woman of integrity or I want to be a man of integrity. It's built with every single choice you make. Every day you have an opportunity to either build your character or destroy it. Today we're going to look at some of the ways in which we can on a daily basis grow and be mature and uh, become women and men of integrity. So let's begin. I was finishing speaking at a school, speaking at chapel one day, and this young man came up to me. I'll never forget him. He was, he was really animated. He was really excited. He had no personal space. He was like right in my face. And he said, Pam, I agree with everything you said. I'm a virgin. I'm going to wait until I'm married. That was all great. I agree with all of that. But I've just got one question for you. If God didn't want me to have sex until I was married, why is it so hard? It should be easy. I shouldn't even have to struggle. I shouldn't even want it. It should be easy. I have the answer to that question. It's hard because everything in life, every struggle in life, it has a purpose. And, and, and James chapter 1, and we, we dealt a little bit with James chapter 1 last session. This session, I want to bring the first part in. Remember, James was speaking to believers, the church, that had been scattered because of persecution. These people, these, these Christians were being severely persecuted and James is speaking directly to them. We have no concept the kind of persecution this church went through. They were losing their families, their jobs, their livelihood, their very lives because of their faith. And James writes to this group of people in James chapter 1 verse 2, he says this, Consider it pure joy. When you face trials of many kinds, consider it joy. When you're at that party and the alcohol gets brought out and you know you need to leave and you know you need to take a stand for what's right and, that's, and, and, and you're thinking, I don't do my friends are going to think I'm stupid, I can't, I'm going to have to call someone, pick me up. This is it. Consider it joy. That 185,000 cold shower that you've had to take and you're trying really hard to control this and it's tough and you're, ugh, consider it joy. How do you do that? How can we consider the trials, the tough stuff, joy? James says this, consider it joy because you know that the trying of your faith, the testing of your faith, that struggle piece is going to bring perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work in you so that you may be mature, complete, lacking nothing. It brings maturity. The testing brings growth. You want maturity. You all want to be mature. How many of you ever said to your parents, well, trust me. Yeah? Okay. And usually when we say, trust me, we're saying, you know, I probably don't deserve this, so I got to really beg for that, okay? Here's what my job is as a parent. I got to let my kid go. I give him a little leeway, let him go a little bit, watch. If he handles himself, she handles herself well. I say, oh, I can trust her. Now we'll give her a little bit more. And then I watch that, trust, give a little more, a little more, a little more, until I know the trust has been built. Trust is earned. Maturity is about growing. It doesn't happen. You don't just like wake up and you're mature. It's going to take a lot of time and testing and, and, and opportunity to fall or to stand. That brings maturity. Every single time you're faced with a choice, we're going to see maturity. We're going to see fall. You know, students, I have seen some unbelievably great things come out of this generation. I have seen students across this nation who are turning this country upside down, displaying maturity that my generation never had. And I know why they are, because they're under so much pressure. There's so much temptation. There's so much opportunity for you to cave that those of you who don't, 
those of you who hang in there and don't cave and bail out and yield to all the temptation that's out there, you're going to be some pretty strong students. See, it's kind of like, you know, weightlifting and bodybuilding. I don't do that, you can tell. And, uh, but some of you might do that. Some of you might be really into that. And maybe, you know, I don't know how much some of you can bench press. I, I might be able to bench press the bar on a good day. I was really lucky. But if I decided I really wanted to do that, all I'd have to do is start, right? You start really small, a little bit of weight, and you work at it, and you work at it, and day after day after day after day, pretty soon, you're pretty strong. Spiritual maturity, emotional maturity, ethical maturity works the same way. Every time you're faced with that choice, you either stand or you fall. You stand or you fall. And every time you get stronger and you get stronger. Hopefully maturity comes with time. It doesn't always work that way. Some people are 40 and are still infants. They've never grown up. You've probably seen a few. And one of the biggest reasons comes, comes right out of this chapter. One of the biggest reasons we got people as adults who are still infants in the way they make choices comes right from James chapter 1. We addressed it briefly last session. It's called the blame game. When you're tempted, when you face that struggle, don't blame God. It's not God. It's you. When you fall, when you mess up, own it. Students, if you ever hope to become a tour, if you ever hope, if you've fallen, to get back up and get and, and go back on the road of healthy, productive, mature living, you've got to own your stuff. You can't play these games. You can't do the blame game thing, okay? Remember, God confronted Adam and Eve about their sin. Did you eat? And uh, Adam said, well, that woman, that don't mean to me, mean God, you gave her to me. <laughs> wasn't me, it was her. Eve said, it wasn't me, it was the serpent. Blame game. I was in a hotel late one night and I was watching this uh, cops show or so, I don't know if it was cops, but it was one of those kind of shows, you know. And I love to watch those because it's like real people being idiots, you know. <laughs> and it's live and, you know, nobody can, you, nobody can act this way. It's just so cool. I was watching this one night, it was late. And this particular city, and I don't know how they rigged this, but they wanted to, to do something about uh, the car theft problem. And so, they had rigged these really nice cars, like Lexuses and BMWs, really nice cars, and they'd left them there by the road, and then they'd rigged them so that they'd left the keys in, I guess, and if you got into the car and you turned the key, immediately the doors would lock, and you could even drive, like a guy would drive like about two or three blocks, I don't know how far, but he'd drive a little ways, and then the entire car would shut down, and he couldn't get out. He's stuck. Car's there, stuck, not going anywhere. And then they put a video camera in there and filmed the whole thing and we got to watch it. So we watched a few people do this and freak out and they couldn't bash windows down. This one guy, this young guy, he's probably in his 20s, it was, it, was the, it was so classic. I wish I would have taped this. He gets in the car and you can tell he's like so pumped. This is so cool, the keys. I'm just gonna, and he, you can see him kind of looking around. Anybody watching, anybody looking? Turns the ignition, he drives. All of a sudden, the car kills. And you can see it on his face. He's like, ah! The police come, drag him out. They're handcuffing him. The whole time we're hearing him, this is what he's doing. It wasn't me. I wasn't here. It wasn't me. I didn't take it. I didn't do it. It wasn't me. It's like, excuse me? We all just, who was it? A ghost? You're there. We got you. It was you. He's blaming everybody else. He screwed up. You want to be an infant for the rest of your life? You want to never be mature? Play the blame game. Every time you mess, I didn't do it. Was her. I didn't mean it, you know? do this at school all the time, don't you? You get an A, it was yours. I did that. I got an A. Get a D, teacher gave that D to me. I didn't, she didn't explain the homework. I didn't get it. It wasn't me. I wasn't there. You know, I didn't earn the D. Teacher gave me the D. I earned the, that's a blame game. Got to stop playing the blame game. It's got to start owning your stuff and say, hey, it was me. I did it. Every one of us matures hopefully. <laughs> we all mature chronologically. We all get older. And uh, we mature by the way we make our choices. And every day we get a chance to, to grow up and make better choices. We've all kind of gone through the process. I have four chairs up here to try and give you a feel for how it is that we make our choices and how we grow up every time we're forced to make these choices. First chair that we're going to deal with right here, chair number one, 
I'm going to call this birth to three, infants and toddlers. Okay, are you with me? Chair number one, infants and toddlers, right here. How do birth to three-year-olds make choices? Been around two-year-olds lately? How does, how does a young child like that, birth to three, make a choice? Yeah, he's, he knows, there's one, cry. They want what they want right now. They don't care who they hurt in the process. They don't care what it takes to get it. Their world is very small. It involves them. I have a little boy at home who's almost three. He didn't get up. He doesn't get up in the middle of the night. He's laying there, gets up, it's dark. He's in his little bed, nobody else is there. He doesn't get up and go, Oh my goodness, you know, it's dark. I'd really like my mom, but I know she's tired. I know she's probably sleeping. She's had a long day. So I'll just lay here and count sheep to make sure I don't wake my mom up. No, he just goes, ah, you know, no, come this minute. My son has no concept of consequences, none. He sees a little fork on the floor. Oh, cool, shiny thing. There's a little outlet. Oh, cool. You know, I mean, that. We're walking in the grass, he sees some dog dew there, laying there, it's oh, dog dew, really cool, soft, in the mouth, right there, that's what he does. That's why two-year-olds have parents. We chase them around going, no, 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 you can't do that, because they don't have any concept of the consequences of their behavior, and they just want what they want it, when they want it, right now. Hopefully we grow up a little bit, we get beyond three, we move into elementary school, that's my chair number two. I'm going to say second, third, and fourth grade. You guys been around second, third, and fourth graders? They're awesome. How do they make choices? Second, third, fourth, you know, that lower elementary. They're into the rules. They really like rules. I'll give you a, a, a challenge here. Guys, maybe after school later this weekend, you go to your neighborhood and you get all the third, fourth graders you can find, okay? Get them all together and say, hey, we're all gonna play a game. We're gonna play a game of kick the can, Red Rover, Red Rover, I don't know, pick a game, okay? Find a game and then tell them the rules. Give them all the rules. This is how the game's played. These are the rules for the game. And then start playing with them and start breaking the rules. Start messing up and doing everything wrong. What are these kids gonna do? Yeah, you're not playing by the rules. I'm going to quit. I'm going to tell my mom the rule says. Second and third graders are really into rules. You want a second and third grader to do something for you? Give them a sticker. They like stickers. You know, here, we're going to put all this stuff on a little chart, and we're going to, if you do, if you brush your teeth, you get a sticker. If you clean your room, you get a sticker. If you help with the dishes, you get a sticker. And at the end of the week, um, depending on how much allowance you have, or how much stickers you have, we'll give you an allowance. Hopefully we grow out of that. We don't usually pay people that way. You know, you go to your job and your boss puts a little chart up and says, give you a sticker. You do it right, give you that sticker. At the end of the week, we'll see how many stickers you got and we'll pay. But it works with elementary kids. They love rules. They want to know the boundaries. You know, how many, go back to third grade with me, especially the boys. Go back and you're up in front of class and some of you are not uh, paying as close attention as you ought to pay. Maybe you're screwing around with your friends a little bit and the teacher says, all right, that's it, I've had it. I'm putting a check on the board. Remember that? You get three checks and what happens to you? No recess for you, okay? So now a third grader is always going to ask two questions. Will I get a sticker or will I get caught? Will I get a sticker or will I get caught? That's the way they make moral choices. That's part of being in the third grade. Hopefully we move beyond that. Move into my third chair. I'm going to call this junior high. 12, 13 year olds. Maybe even 14 right into there. How do we make choices now? You guys know this. Come on. How do junior hires make choices about what they're going to do? What is, that's right, there, what is everybody else doing? Even that kid, and I always love this kid at any school I'm in, that kid that is absolutely not like anybody else. You know what I mean? Just totally the, uh, that kid is still making choices based on, he's just looking at what you're all doing and making sure he doesn't do that, okay? We're still making our choices based on what everybody else is doing. We've all done that. I've done it. I've been there. I'll never forget. My mom and I have a great relationship. I love my mom. She's awesome. We got along most of the time. Summer before, about my freshman year of high school, 
we decided to go shopping for clothes. And uh, we did that usually before school started. And we had a knock them down, drag them fight right there in the mall. And I don't know, my mom just, I, she just couldn't understand. I had to have this shirt. It was really important to me that it be that shirt. And she just couldn't grasp it because it cost a little bit of money. And she thought that this shirt over here was just the exact same shirt, just didn't cost quite so much. Why couldn't I have that? Now, it seems kind of silly now, but to me, it was a big deal. It was a simple shirt, had a little collar. See, students wear this a lot, just simple, short sleeve, little shirt, collar, buttons. The deal was this particular shirt had a tiny little alligator right there. And I had to have the alligator. I mean, it just, I had to. My mom's like, well, you can go down here. That same shirt that has a little tiger. Everybody will know you got that at Penny's. <laughs> I can't have that. I have to have the alligator. I mean, I'm serious. It was a big deal to me. I know you probably think that that was weird, you know, that I, we had to have the little loafers and the skirt and the little... We had a little pin that had to pin our skirt together and the little elegant. That was important to me. It was really important to me. Hopefully we grow out of that, however, and, and we learn to make choices not based on what everybody else is doing and what are they doing and what do they look like and I need to, to fit in and be cool. Hopefully we move on to chair number four, which I call adulthood. Now let me be real clear with you. A lot of people never get there. A lot of people never reach chair number four. But sometimes we do. Chair number four is where we're capable of making choices based on what's right and what's wrong, an internal set of values. It has nothing to do with what everybody else is doing, what feels good to me, or what the rule is. It's about choosing to do what's right when maybe no one else is doing that. My favorite story from the Old Testament comes in Daniel, Daniel chapter 3. It's a story of three young men, very young men, who has, has nine and ten-year-old boys were taken as captives, taken from their families where they were taught faith and values, and they were taken as slaves into a very pagan culture where there was a lot of idol worship and, and pagan stuff going on. And these young boys at the age of nine and ten had to learn to live their faith in a world where nobody else was living it. And as we meet them in Daniel chapter 3, they're already late teens, 18 and 19. They're in Babylon, and the king, Nebuchadnezzar, says, we're going to put a big old golden statue up here, and we're going to blow some horn, and everybody needs to bow. When the music plays, everybody bows. This is the way that kings in that time kept people in subjection to them. They just put a big statue up made some noise and made everybody bow. If you don't bow, here's the rule, if you don't bow, you're getting thrown into a fiery furnace, okay? So bow or burn, that's the deal. And these guys had to decide what they were going to do. Their names were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The uh, music played, everybody bowed. Now let me tell you something, there were others in that in Babylon who I believe followed God, who I believe in their heart would have said to you, I do not buy this bowing to idols things. I am a worshiper of the one true God. I believe there was probably them, but they're probably do what I've done and what you've done, you know? I mean, it's bow or burn, so you can see I'm going to be like, music plays, I'm going to be bowing, going, okay, God, my body's bowing, my heart's not, okay? Please see my heart. I'm bowing here because I don't want the fire. But it's my heart. Just hear my heart, God. You know that I don't really mean to do that. Three young men said, we won't bow. We're not going to bow. Everybody can bow. We aren't going to. And stood. Amazing. They were dragged in front of the king. Daniel chapter 3, verse 16 says this. Their words to the king when he said, what are you doing? I said, bow or burn. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego looked at the king and said, we don't need to defend ourselves in front of you in this matter. The God we serve is able to save us from that fire. Go ahead, throw us in. God can save us. That's amazing faith. That is amazing faith. You know what? The bigger faith came when they said this. But even if he doesn't, even if we burn to a crisp, we will not bow. We're not bowing. Commandment number one says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And these young men took that seriously. 
I want to have that kind of strength. I don't know if I do, but I'd love to have it. I'll never forget, I'd uh, been called by the state of Alaska to come in and speak at a conference, and I was a little nervous about it because the state was bringing me in. I got off the plane, and there were people there with signs and saying, you know, usually I, I get somewhere where I'm going, and they're like, oh, Pam, nice to have you. So glad you're here. These people weren't excited about it. Go back to Minnesota. We don't want you here. We don't, we don't want abstinence taught here. We don't, you know, you, and all the other stuff they were saying. I don't know. They just didn't like me. And everything in me wanted to turn around and say, forget this. I don't need this. I don't need to take this abuse. I'd get back on the plane, go home. But God said to me, no, I got something for you to do, and you need to walk through there, and you need to do what I brought you here to Alaska to do. I walked through those people. I got to my hotel. I cried. I'll admit it. I was not happy. I get to the deal. I've got kids in front of me, and I got all these adults through whom my entire presentation just reamed me. I mean, just called me down, said everything I said was stupid, and, and I, it was just terrible. And these kids, actually, I loved it because the kids started to realize you know, how desperately I was trying to share with them and how adults were not being so cool. And eventually I just said to the kids, look, I've tried to tell you something because I love you and I care about you and there are some adults here who don't want you to hear what I have to say. But if you, you know, if you want to talk to me, this is my hotel room. It's where I am. Let's find a time to talk. I had 50 kids pile into my hotel room <laughs> and we just sat around and just talked and I got to share with them about my relationship with Jesus and how much he meant to me and it was just awesome, it was great. But you know what, I would have loved to run. It wasn't easy. My junior year of high school, I was attending a parochial school. My parents had sent me to parochial school through most of my high school years and uh, I won a speech contest for the state of Michigan and I was offered an opportunity I won a trip to Washington, D.C., and I was pretty excited. I'd never been on a plane. I'd never gone anywhere without my family. So this was going to be really exciting. My mom and dad weren't sure they wanted me to go because there were going to be some public school kids there. So they weren't so sure I should go on this trip. I finally convinced them that I could go, and my mom, as we were packing, getting ready to go to D.C., looked at me, and she said, Pam, you are not just representing your school on this trip. You're representing Jesus Christ. I got on the plane, went to D.C., we broke up into our small groups and uh, began to tour the nation's capital. And, and in my small group, there was this guy who was an exchange student from West Germany, from another school in my town. And uh, he was kind of cute, and he had an accent, so I was kind of cool. And we began to kind of talk and get to know each other. And, and uh, Thursday night, they were going to take us all to the theater, the theater in the round, and then after the theater, they were going to, or after or dinner first and then to the theater. And I was so excited. We were going to go out to a really nice dinner, no Burger King, a really good dinner. And then we were going to go to this uh, live theater. I was so excited. I've grown up on the stage. I was so excited about getting to see live theater. About Tuesday, we began to get dates. Now, we were all going together on the bus, but we had to start going, will you go with me Thursday night to dinner? Guido asked me to go with him. I was so excited. I was going to dinner. I was going to the theater. I had a date. Life is good. We went and had dinner. Guido and I walked along the Platonic River. He held my hand. So cool. We got to the theater. We sat down. The lights went down. We're waiting for the, the play to start. And I was just so excited. Lights went up. And the play began. An unbelievable foul language came from that stage. And the Holy Spirit, with the voice of my mother, said, you need to leave. I said, no way, <laughs> no way. All these guys are here, my friends are here. I, I am not going to make an idiot of myself right here. They're, they're going to think, well, look at that little parochial school kid who can't handle a little language has to get up and leave. I'm not doing that. Holy Spirit said, you got to leave. <laughs> I argued quite a bit, and I even had really good arguments, like I'd have to tell the sponsor, and they'd have to get a taxi, and then take me back, and it just isn't going to work. I'm not listening. I don't hear, la, 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 I'm here, my body, but I'm not hearing it. La, la. <laughs> Finally, I, I said, okay, I need to leave. And I leaned over to my sponsor, and I said, I'm sorry, I, I got to go. And she was really cool. She was like, I am so sorry, and I'll get you a taxi. We'll go back together. I got back to my hotel room, and I just started crying. I felt like such an idiot. 
You know, I can't handle a little language. Guido came back, the rest of the group came back. He called my hotel. He says, Pam, I need to talk to you. Can you come down here in the lobby? I said, sure. Went down to the lobby, and this young man looked at me. He says, Pam, I've been in the United States for a whole year, and I have never met anyone like you. Never met anyone who was really willing to walk what they talked, to live their faith, to not just say what they believe, but to live it. He said, I don't know what you've got, but I want it. And right there in the lobby of a Washington, D.C. hotel, Guido accepted Christ into his life and began a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I want, you to t I want to tell you right now, I had no idea what God would do with that young man. He went back to, to Germany. He began working with the Operation Mobilization on the ship Dulas. He began to distribute Christian literature all over the coast of Africa, went back to seminary, and is now a pastor in one of the largest churches in Hamburg, West Germany. Because one night in Washington, D.C., someone was willing to stand when everybody else bowed. You know, students, Bible says in the days of Noah and in the days of Job that God's eyes roved the earth looking for someone, just one person who would be willing to stand. I believe he still does that today. And I believe that in the immense amount of pressure, when everybody's bowing, when your entire generation is bowing, that there's going to be some men and women of God who are going to be the kind of men and women they're going to do what's right when no one else does. Just a short while ago, we lost a real woman of faith, a woman who was willing to sacrifice and do what God's called her to do, no matter what everybody else was doing and no matter what it cost, a woman by the name of Mother Teresa. And you know, I tell you, every one of us, sometimes we look at people and we say, well, they're really, wow, I could never do that. Yes, you could. It's a choice. It's a daily choice to get up and say, you know what, God, I'm going to do what you called me to do. It doesn't matter who else is doing it. It doesn't matter what it costs me. I'm going to put you first every single day. And every day that you do it, you get stronger and you get stronger and you get stronger until pretty soon. And I watched, Mother Teresa, I watched and read. and I it, She breathed Jesus. Everything she did because she had done it from the time she was young. Day after day after day. Every single one of you has the opportunity to choose. I can't choose for you, you choose. Every choice you make has a consequence. And you can choose to bail out, to yield, to fall, or you can choose in the face of a lot of struggle to stand up and be different. It's a choice you need to make. As we end this time and this entire series, I want, to think, I want you to think along these lines. When was the last time you were faced with a choice? You were in a position where you had an opportunity to stand, to make a difference in someone's life, to do what was right when no one else was doing what was right. I know you've had those. So for some of you, it was yesterday. Maybe it was a week ago. Maybe it was a month ago. Get that time when you were at a crossroads and you had a choice to make. I want it in your head. And when it's in your head right now, quietly, I'd just like everybody to just kind of bow your heads and kind of close your eyes. And, and it's not because we're going to pray or anything. It's because I want you alone with God. So just everybody kind of get alone with God right now, wherever you are. And I want you to get that time in your head. Get it in your head. Do you see it? You had a choice to make. You were there, crossroads. Everybody was doing it. You had a choice to make. And I want you to put yourself in one of these chairs right now. Put yourself there. How'd you make that choice? Where are you sitting? Some of you, if you'd be really honest, are saying, you know what, Pam, I'm sitting right here in chair number one. That's where I'm sitting. Every time I have a choice to make, I make a choice about what feels good to me right now and what I want. And it doesn't matter who I hurt in the process, I want what I want right now. If that's you, if that's the way you're making choices today, I got two words for you. Grow up. It's time to grow up can't keep making choices like infants. It's time to grow up. Some of you would say, you know what, Pam, I'm not in that chair. But I, I put myself in chair number two. I need to know the rules. I need someone else to tell me what the rule is, and then I obey that because I want them to pat me on the back and say, aren't you OK? Or maybe it's not that. Maybe you want to know what the rule is so that uh, you can ask this, well, will I get caught? Will anybody see? Can I get away with it? I spent a lot of time sitting in that chair. I spent a lot of time there because it was desperately important to me for other people to think I was OK. And I wasn't making choices based on what was right and wrong internally. I was making a choice about whether or not I'd get a sticker, 
would someone come along and say, that's where you're sitting in chair number two. I got two words for you today. It's time to grow up. It's time to grow up. Maybe you'd say, you know what, Pam, I'm not there, but I'm in chair number three. Boy, I'm living. It's really important to me what my friends think. It's really important to me that I look like everybody else, that I do what everybody else is doing, that I'm not weird, that I'm not some kind of Jesus freak. I, I, I don't want that. I want to be just even keel with everybody else. If you're sitting in chair number three, I got two words for you today. Grow up. It's time to grow up. Some of you would say to me, you know what? No, Pam, I'm sitting in that chair number four, and I'm making choices based on what's right and wrong, and I'm trying really hard to honor God in every choice that I make, and it's not easy. I have some words for you from James today. Good for you. Life to you. God's going to do unbelievable things through you if you'll sit in that chair. The reality is and the truth is for all of us that sometimes we jump chairs and one day we can feel like we're making those good choices and the next day we're making selfish choices. My hope for you would be that over the next days and weeks and months that you would ask God to show you how it is that you're making choices and that you would make some progress, that you would begin to grow up and mature and you'd begin to be the kind of young men and women that would be capable of doing what's right when no one else does. We're going to turn this world upside down with young men and young women who will do just that. Let's pray. Should we pray? Father, thanks for today. God, thanks for these students right here. God, you could turn this state, this country upside down with just the students we have sitting right in this room. God, I pray that there would be young men and young women out here. God, it just takes two or three who would be willing to give you everything they are, who would be willing to in the face of what all of their friends and what the culture is doing, that they would be willing to stand and not bow. God, we pray that you would give us the strength. It's not our desire to be popular or successful. It's our desire to stand before you someday and hear you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Keep us faithful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.